yeah, but as Boris said, I was kind of invited to do this the first time last year, and this idea of having a stage and half an hour to present the most interesting photography that I come across in my um, editorial research, I uh, was like a carte blanche situation, it was amazing, and um, I, I literally did that. I went through my, my last um, months of research and picked the stuff that uh, I felt was the most outstanding or most interesting. Not necessarily like screaming at you, but, but stuff that I felt I, yeah, I often can't use in our books, but I would like to give a stage to. Um, and I thought, well, that's once in a lifetime opportunity, yeah? make use of it. Now it's this like, second in a lifetime opportunity. And um, I thought it's, uh, even though it's, it's fun to do this kind of uh, choosing your favorites, um, I probably add something more to it because I feel there's so much happening in photography right now um, on, on all sorts of levels that we might profit from having a number of different perspectives on the subject. So the group of people, the, the initially five, um, are actually showing a spectrum of these topics from uh, a non-photographer who takes great photos to a professional photographer that represents the the joy and, and, and passion and, and also like quirkiness a little bit to a very um, engaged author type of photographer to somebody who looks at photography through the filter of algorithm to somebody talking about the innovation that's driven by uh, technology. So long spectrum. It was like a nice arc and then the middle dropped because Bettina uh, couldn't make it. She's just came back from Africa and had some kind of virus in fact. So the, the serious photographer, the kind of author I mentioned, is not going to be here. So we're a photography panel almost without photographers today. <laughs> we'll see. Um, the other thing that I realized is that Bettina, the one that's missing, is the only one that I could pronounce the name of correctly, um, which is also an interesting challenge for me today. But um, nevertheless, I have four people that um, will show you, I hope, um, I'm sure, actually, uh, a variety of different aspects that I hope will answer, or even more importantly, raise a couple of interesting questions about what photography is these days. Um, uh, um, like an idea of where it goes next. And uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to discussing with you um, how and, and where this could kind of fit in this whole spectrum of editorial, the design part, as well as the um, journalistic part, which from my point of view doesn't even exist as like two separate entities to me, it's like the storytelling, whatever your medium is somehow. Um, all right, Anna, are you ready? Please welcome Anna. Uh, and I ask her to pronounce her <laughs> last name. Oh, actually, quickly, I, I am, um, you know, I've been in that situation where somebody moderating a talk kind of introduces the speaker and kind of tells the exact story that the speaker was meant to start with. And then you, as a speaker, you're there like, mm, that's not good. So I leave the introduction to them, but we talked about it and before, and you're, you're not missing anything. Let's go. <laughs> go. Um, so, hello, my name is Anna Oj, and I am a portrait photographer. Um, I currently live between London and Barcelona, where I um, mostly do commissions. Um, um, I mostly work editorially um, for weekend magazines like uh, The Telegraph, Weekend Magazine, The Sunday Times, um, New York Times, um, amongst others. And I also work for art and design magazines uh, like Frame or Monocle. Um, so today, um, I will show you my personal work. Um, specifically the last project I worked on, which is called Tales Beneath the Melting Ice. And I will also introduce you to a satellite story that came, um, came about when, while doing this. Um, I guess a lot of times I get asked um, how I found my projects. Um, I think one of my strengths is that I'm quite honest. I'm a really bad writer and I'm a worse bullshitter which makes me not too suitable for uh, grant applications. So what I do in order to find my personal work is uh, work really hard on my editorial work. Um, I save money, 
Um, I do the projects I want to do, and then when I come back with the project finished, what I do is try to sell it to um, different magazines. Uh, so, for instance, partially, Tales Beneath the Melting Ice was uh, funded by selling the previous project I had done, which was about, uh, about miners in Pakistan. Um, I sold it to the Independent on Sunday uh, in the UK. I sold it to El País in Spain and then I sold it to an arts and design magazine from Australia called Frankie. Uh, so this is how I got the money. Um, now I find my, myself um, uh, about to start a new project, and this is what I'm gonna do with Tells uh, Beneath the Melting Ice, which is like trying to move it around. Anyway, um, all right, so uh, what's, uh, what's uh, Tales Within the Melting Ice about? Um, it is about uh, an, abandoned, uh, an abandoned utopia in the Arctic, um, Pyramiden. Pyramiden is a utopian town. Uh, it was um, funded in 1910 by Sweden uh, and was bought by the Soviet Union in 1927. Uh, with it, the Soviet Union uh, bought, uh, got the right to exploit the place, which was really rich on coal. Um, so what they did was, um, we are in Norwegian territory, we are going to create a great um, town to show the West how great uh, communism was. So they created this like perfect town uh, with great infrastructure. In its heyday, there were 1,000 uh, people working there, um, and they were really, really eager to be working there because they had uh, the best, I mean, I've read um, texts that say that people lived better in such extreme conditions than in the Soviet Union itself. So, um, uh, you could see uh, Soviet architecture, um, uh, aesthetics, culture everywhere. For instance, everything was really, really well curated. For example, um, the colors of the buildings were to match the mountains where the mines were. Or, uh, for example, this grass that you see here, not full of snow, basically, because we went in the summer, uh, was brought from what's now Ukraine um, on a boat. So probably the biggest beautification project the Arctic has ever seen. Ever seen. So... Um, here you see a little bit more of um, the town. Uh, the town, I forgot to say. Uh, so basically, um, the town uh, was uh, packed with people until 1998. In 1998, the town stopped being, um, I, stopped being uh, financially sustainable, uh, which meant that everybody had to live from one day to the other. So from 1998 until 2007, it was a ghost town. And in 2007, uh, Russia decided to send temporary miners to work there. So my project, what I wanted to do was sort of photograph this like sort of deserty um, looking place and sort of combine it with uh, portraits of the people who are actually living there. Um, so here you see a little bit how it looks. Um, this was the skull, uh, and obviously because they wanted the Westerners to, to really see how powerful communism was, they would send the best teachers for the sons of the miners. Um, uh, it was, they had amazing uh, sports center. Uh, this was the library, which looks quite sad, but apparently had amazing books um, and lots and lots of literature. Um, they had uh, music rooms. Um, they actually had this uh, really big um, room, maybe like this, with a really big grand piano where like, they would bring people from um, the Soviet Union to play only for the miners. Um, they also had three heated swimming pools in the Arctic. Um, and then they also had a gymnastic room. Um, and I guess like what I liked, I mean, I was really surprised when I went there just to see that this town was um, actually almost self-sustainable. Um, they used the power of um, the coal, this is the mine here, um, to heat the whole place. They even had greenhouses uh, where they would grow their own vegetables, they had cows, they had pigs. So it was quite an amazing place. This is the pond that would feed water to the town, which is at the end. Um, and then here you have a few more images. This is the sign you see when you get to, um, from the sea. Um, and this is the bust of Lenin. Um, so as I was telling you, what I decided to do is sort of combine these like 
sort of reflection of um, the remains of a um, forgotten and uh, ultimately failed utopia and sort of combine it with the people who were sent now uh, by Russia to sort of show the few tourists um, who end up going there, um, sort of like walk them around, uh, um, around Soviet history. So this is Sasha, who's um, the guide. Um, he has the keys of all the buildings, so if you want to take photographs there, you need to be friends with this one. Um, this, he's posing in um, the Avenue of the Great October. Um, this is the handyman and the cook. Only 13 people live there now, so it's quite crazy. And this is Kirill um, uh, posing in his flip-flops in the museum, which is also um, a hotel, which is also uh, the place where they live, the place where everybody eats. So, and these are two more miners who take care of um, uh, the, um, dismantling the infrastructure. Um, Mount Pyramiden. Okay, so as I was telling you before, um, I did um, the Stales Beneath the Melting Ice project, but there was a satellite project which uh, is sailing the Arctic. Um, the way I got access to do Tales Beneath the Melting Ice was by getting slightly too tipsy one night in a pub and meeting a friend of a friend who told me about a full-length documentary that he was going to do about the dream of this Mediterranean sailor who wanted to sail from Barcelona up north until he reached the ice. Um, so I convinced him to uh, get on board, but in exchange he told me that I would have to uh, document a part of the trip. And he would use that on, um, on, and turn it into a magazine of the trip. Uh, so these are a few images that I took. This is Albert, who's the captain. For some strange reason, he would sleep always outside. Uh, 24 hours daylight, because we went there in the summer. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess the landscape was quite weird. Um, I really liked it, actually. So basically, with a few of these images, what we ended up doing was um, a really cool magazine at the end, uh, which was called Sailing the Arctic, and sort of like um, showed the trip of, like the dream of this um, sailor. This is Jute, who's um, our guide. She was the mm, woman with the gun. You need to have a gun if you go to Svalbard. And um, in Svalbard, there, were, um, this, there was this town um, that was a science town called Nialesun, which uh, was quite, in, quite, quite cool. And yeah, this is, a, um, this is the magazine. And I'm not going to show it all because it's really long and probably too, but just so that you have a feel of how it ended up looking. I like the fact that it was not to overwhelming or overwhelmingly designed. Um, and yeah, well, that's all. Thanks so much. <laughs> so clear. Yeah, the, the interesting part here is um, the, the reason that I, or the, the starting point um, that I had with her work was something very different, uh, actually very colorful, editorial, uh, poppy kind of, uh, I could say, like Gestalten type of uh, content. And, um, and then that, that in itself was enough kind of to consider uh, her, but then I came across that story and I felt um, the, the most uh, rewarding in, in any story to me is when I, I really feel I see something for the first time or hear something for the first time and there's like going to a place that you've never been or didn't even know existed uh, or taking a journey or taking that risk is something that I, I think a photographer needs more than a style somehow. So that's the starting point. Um, and we'll continue with Adam. Are you ready? I could actually open one of those bottles in the meantime. No one did that yet. Do you have them in cold as well? No, it's, it's the last one. It's the last Later. One. So, um, a few words about Adam. Uh, he, he's the non-photographer that keeps surprising me with his pictures. Um, and I'm, I'm not telling you why, because that's what he's going to talk about. But um, I kind of met him in, in a variety of different uh, circumstances. So, from 
uh, running into each other at Milan Furniture Fair in an exhibition that he curated, set up. Uh, then I kind of approached him once and asked him for pictures of a beer that he and his colleagues uh, created. Uh, yeah, there's, there's much more to it. He, he will tell you. <laughs> Please you. welcome, Adam. Thank you for the introduction, Sven. Uh, first, I would like to say that I'm not a photographer. And uh, I am an editor, writer, curator, uh, thinker about design and architecture. Uh, it's really my passion. Uh, it's me, like four years ago, in, my, uh, in the middle of my biggest passion, which is uh, rediscovering uh, modernist architecture or design from the 20th century. I, uh, when I travel uh, for work, for holiday, for anything, I have to discover some, uh, some architecture. I really love it. Uh, for me, it's kind of adventure, uh, because, uh, for example, I really like to visit houses and buildings which, are, which were not even published since they were built. And uh, I'm searching in old magazines, uh, in old books for addresses. And uh, I, uh, I'm trying to, look, to search these houses. And I knock the door. And uh, I, I'm asking the inhabitants of these houses to, to look at the interior. And after I'm photographing it uh, myself or with my colleagues uh, who are photographers, or uh, and after I'm trying to publish it somewhere. Um, basically, uh, just really short introduction what I'm doing uh, or what I'm living for. Uh, this is magazine Dolce Vita. It's a, a Prague-based magazine. Actually, I'm, I'm from Prague, Czech Republic. So uh, I'm working as an editor since uh, six years now for this magazine. It's kind of commercial design, art, um, architecture, and fashion magazine. Uh, also, I teach. Uh, I teach uh, at Scholastica. It's a special private uh, platform for uh, design and art. And I teach uh, art, uh, design, and architecture history. Uh, also, I have a radio show at uh, local Prague radio, uh, which is about uh, the, sh the show is about design, of course. Uh, but uh, what uh, is for me the really the um, personal thing? Uh, uh, it's a creative collective called Okolo. Uh, it means around in Czech, and uh, we found it uh, with my colleagues uh, in 2008. And uh, we are working in a field of design and architecture uh, in many aspects. Uh, we are trying to present uh, some uh, information in a, a nice visual uh, style and uh, really proper curated way. So we do magazines, uh, we do publications, we do exhibitions, uh, we do products with designers, and uh, we are trying to find new way of presenting design and actually what we really like. So it's it, th th this project was born from passion. It's nothing about money or, or something that uh, you need to, to work, but it, it was really, really a great occasion to, to do with my, fr my best friends to do great work. Uh, but next to it, I am uh, contributing to several international magazines. Uh, about design like Frame or Mark or Wallpaper or A10, uh, Domus Magazine, I contribute for uh, New York blog Cool Hunting and so on. So these are my channels uh, where I can uh, present the things. Uh, this is the magazine. Uh, so, and now I would like to talk about, about this uh, kind of uh, rediscovering uh, hidden, vintage, uh, historical architecture and design. So this is magazine Okolo. It's a third issue we did with my colleagues. And it's uh, about Vienna. So we, we went to Vienna 
uh, and and around uh, surrounding uh, to to visit like uh, hidden workshops or hidden architecture. So, for example, this we uh, we visited uh, amazing uh, Le Corbusier style house by uh, Ernst Plischke, very important. Um, uh, modernist architect from Austria, and I like really this uh, moment of adventure that you are you are going to something which was uh, never published for ages. Uh, this is the second this is the second uh, magazine in the row which we did on a specific location. This is in uh, uh, Liguria. We we were in. Uh, uh, yeah, it's an Italian coast, uh, it's a part of Italian coast, and we visited, uh, for example, Mario Galvani, uh, architect who uh, lived in this futuristic uh, rebuilt structure in the mountains of Liguria, and we chat with him, and uh, we did article on his work. Yeah, and the, and the latest uh, issue uh, of our magazine is uh, about Lausanne. Uh, we collaborated with Ecole University in Lausanne, in Switzerland, and uh, we did this uh, publication, which I have also here in my bag, so if you would uh, to have a look closer after, you can. Um, so again, uh, we are trying to, to visit all the places ourselves, uh, to investigate something really extraordinary like this, for example, which uh, we visit a guy called uh, Daniel Gratalup. It's an almost 90 years old architect who experimented with uh, organic forms and, uh, and sprayed concrete, uh, which is the specific uh, building um, system which was used by uh, one group of architects in the in the 60s and i'm particularly very interested in this movement for example this is his apartment uh, with built-in speakers into the into the whole structure of the apartment which we found in the really concrete like modernist block but he rebuilt it as a cave and uh, he's he's still living there uh, it's one of the detail of his apartment too. It's him with his uh, with his amazing uh, model of uh, of a vertical city, uh, which he built uh, during 70s. Uh, it was uh, one of the biggest models in the world. Uh, he he said it to us. Uh, he said that he is uh, in Guinness World, uh, World Guinness World Book. Uh, with this model, because uh, it was like maybe 25 of these towers in the landscape, and uh, some of the towers are uh, were required uh, acquired by MoMA in New York. Uh, yeah, so this is the this is our uh, there are our magazines which we produce ourselves. Uh, we do everything in-house, in our studio, like the, the, the trip, uh, the, the interviews, the graphic design, uh, the text, and so on. And these are some images which I uh, took myself uh, during my trips, and afterwards I published them uh, in, uh, in some uh, really good magazines for me. So, uh, like really special thing for me is Ico Parisi. It's an architect uh, who was active in uh, Lake Como in Milan, close to Milan, and uh, I have visited uh, his uh, uh, his houses, uh, which was which were built uh, during 50s, and uh, afterwards I published the story in Wallpaper magazine. Uh, actually, not with my pictures, of course, because I'm not a professional photographer. So. Uh, but but this is really what what really satisfy me because uh, you are searching something and uh, it is interesting for for someone else. Uh, this was really one of my architect best architecture stories uh, I have experienced. Uh, it's a, a old pair of 90 years old guys who are living in this uh, super sculptural structure in Liège, Belgium. Uh, and uh, we found it uh, 
even we didn't know the address of this building, which was immersed in a, veget in a forest in Belgium. And uh, with, my, with my great collaborator, Tomáš Souček, he is, a, he is really a professional architecture photographer. So we did the pictures of the, of the structure, and after we, uh, we offered the, the series to Domus magazine, which uh, published it uh, like three years ago. And uh, yeah. Also, I contribute for Dem magazine, uh, which is the, also Sven is contributing. Uh, it's a art and design magazine. So, for example, all of or some of my uh, Italian architecture adventures were published uh, in this uh, in this survey, where also my friend, my colleague from Ocolo, uh, Matej, contributed with his illustration. So there are s several uh, architects which I uh, or buildings which I have visited. So it's kind of. Uh, survey of Italian modernism, which is kind of revisited. I also publish uh, something on Sight Unseen, which is my also favorite uh, favorite site. And uh, last year I, I have also visited uh, George Nakashima, which is uh, one of the greatest furniture makers of 20th century in, uh, in Pennsylvania, in USA, and uh, I did a whole story also with my photographers, photo, uh, photos, uh, again for them magazine, which was for like eight pages. And uh, this really quickly, because I have to uh, finish, uh, this is Casa Tabarelli, amazing house by Carlos Carpa, and we have amazing occasion to spend a whole weekend in this house. And, uh, this is the example how we want uh, with my colleagues to uh, to go further uh, of magazine medium and we want to create kind of spatial uh, installations which you can read as a magazine so this was the exhibition in Sofia in Bulgaria which was about this house and you you could read the about the house in a in a gallery yeah and and this uh, traveling and so on is uh, now also the inspiration for our new project called European Design Stories and we are doing interviews uh, and photo essays uh, uh, on this website. And last picture, uh, it's, the, it's the documentation that I am uh, always uh, happy to visit some things. Uh, Yesterday I was in amazing space of Hermann Rossa, a sculptor in München, which uh, this, this sculptor he built uh, atelier for himself during the 60s, and it's a really uh, uh, amazing, concrete, minimalist space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, how many of you knew the space that he visited in Munich? Okay, this is, this is exactly what I ha the situation I have with him all the time. Is that he comes up with these pictures of places that I feel like probably should have seen, but I never even heard of. And, and that's the magic, that the kind of photography is research. Uh, I, I kind of disagree that your pictures shouldn't be in the magazine because you're not a f professional photographer, but um, I guess we're, we're coming back to that a little later. Again, would you come up already? Um, Speeding it up a little bit. Um, right, so uh, photographer, non-photographer, non and now uh, when I asked him, he said, yeah, just say it's Ken from Berlin and I'll do the rest, so go for it. Exactly, hey, <laughs> hey hi. So um, that's my name, Ken, and uh, I used some cool emoticons to make it a bit designy. And uh, my background is uh, advertising, so I worked for cool agencies like Jung van Maat, McCann Erickson, TBW, Leo Burnett, and stuff like that. And I also grabbed a lot of Khan Lions, so I'm super proud to see them always. It's uh, for Volkswagen and Mercedes, and uh, so um, that makes me proud. But then I had the feeling advertising is changing, or at the end it's shit. And that's the reason why I started an art project. And this art project was... Um, founded by us four young, beautiful, handsome boys. Also pointing to this awesome emoticon. 
And uh, it started all with the iPhone uh, 3GS. So I don't know if you heard about that, but this is, the, this is an old iPhone. Yeah? It looks also the emoticons and the, 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 the icons, uh, glossy back in the days. And uh, people took images, photography, with this kind of devices. And um, you can see it's really artistic, but the people, they had no ego. They, they, had no, they were not uh, proud of the work because uh, the cell phones are cheesy, two megapixels, and, uh, oh, no, this is not art. That's the reason why I want to give them a stage. So our goal was, um, hey, uh, your images are awesome. We bring you to the Guggenheim or to the MoMA and stuff like that. That's the reason why we started uh, grabbing the images and uh, put them into the uh, guerrilla exhibition and um, gave them a stage. Yeah? So this is the beginning of that. Then we made an exhibition and uh, printed all the images big uh, on, on acryl, debond, and uh, or the same uh, kind of producers uh, where Andreas Gorski is also printing uh, uh, at Grieger and stuff like that. And uh, for sure, everybody joined us because of the free beer, as always. That's Berlin. People are coming when there's free beer, like here. So. And um, yeah, that was the exhibition kind of, and that was in New York because it was super successful, and that's the reason why we decided to go to New York and um, yeah, hang all the images uh, onto the wall. That's the reason why we started a startup. I don't know, it's uh, super common in Berlin that everybody is starting a startup. And um, yeah, that's, we got some funding. That's the reason why we uh, uh, had a proper photographer to make a beautiful shot of us. And yeah, that's the, that's the team. Back in the days, Android developers, iPhone developers, the community support, and yeah, it's uh, it's uh, the starting point. And then uh, two years before, that was uh, on our terrace. The terrace was bigger than uh, our office, and uh, that's that's how it is in Berlin because it's so cheap. And uh, that was the kitchen, 40 people, and right now 60 people. And that was back in last September in New York, and we flew the whole people to New, to New York and we had this kind of festival and uh, celebrated photography. So in a nutshell, what is uh, I am? So it's a, it's a kind of a creative photography community and a marketplace where you can also buy images for real photography because if you have a, a DSLR camera like, like her, people stage and, 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 and if you have a pointing with a cell phone, then the people are more real and uh, not uh, staged. Say hi. <laughs> Perfect. And um, yeah, that's, uh, we also build an app. Uh, it's also like Instagram and stuff like that. So it's uh, a discover feed. It's, uh, it's um, a popular feed and stuff like that. So just download that. It's also for free. You can check it out and give me feedback. I'm here later. And um, yeah, in a, the community. What's the community? So we are building the, this community for um, yeah, smokers and uh, you see yeah, a variety of beautiful images, right? Because we have 50 million photographers worldwide. That's also in Istanbul. Then you see also on the Taksim Square, you can grab a lot of interesting shots and can put them also into a marketplace. And everybody knows the Apple campaign right now. You can use the cell, photograph cell phone photography also for billboards, big uh, advertisement and stuff like that. And yeah, uh, foodies, da -da 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 -da. and yeah, this is, yeah, we have more than 60 million images right now. And yeah, they, they are more sophisticated, but also real photography. And you can see it's, yeah, really nice stuff. And how did we do that? We organized a lot of meetups and stuff like that. Without marketing, we grew uh, to a decent number of, of photographers. So meetups is super important that you, you are meeting in real, right? It's not only tapping on the screen and having uh, likes and comments on the, on the devices. It's important. This is a portal. There are also a lot of people um, uh, joining these meetups and also carrying or wearing uh, IM t-shirts for us and doing free marketing for us. That's also nice. And that was also in Indonesia. And um, this is a nice community. The community was also helping us to translate the uh, uh, application. So we started in English, and then people are helping us uh, to translate it into uh, Japan, Japanese. And uh, it's not that my mom is all the translation. So they are the community helping us. So the festival, also, you can see Sven in the corner. So it's an exhibition. It's also a um, conference. So we invite interesting people 
and uh, they talk about the future of the photography. And what we are really good at is a uh, party. So um, drinking beer and having fun is the key asset of uh, Berlin startups. Um, this is uh, a video, but I thought it's maybe I too long. But that so festival we did in New York. In New York City. And um, yeah, really as you can imagine, you gorgeous. it's expensive. <laughs> no, but I, I thought feeling we have to cut it down a bit. And um, yeah, community missions. We are also teaming up with cool brands like Mercedes or BMW, collecting interesting images for uh, those kind of brands. And these uh, asked us, hey, can you run a competition? And it's, it's really nice what kind of images uh, people are uploading to our community. And um, Huffing Post is also a big. Uh, Uber, and you can see, if you have a lot of photographers worldwide, you have a lot of uh, nice content and uh, from every city, and the clients can use it uh, everywhere. So that's also nice. And then we also have a magazine, because we want to always give something back to the community, right? And uh, I like it to have it more physical, and that's the reason why I decided to have a magazine. So check it out. Also, the Sebastian from Soda uh, is uh, uh, counting on you guys. And um, yeah, and this is also cool to bring the digital world into the physical world. And uh, it's also in, in cool stores like Gestalten or in Barcelona in the in-house in or stuff like that, or at Soda in an art gallery and stuff like that. And it's also cool marketing for us and people love it. And uh, also we are teaming up with Getty Images. They got also one million images and all the Amateur photographers get uh, money from them because uh, they sell them for us and uh, everybody's happy. Even me, I'm a crappy photographer, but I also made 200 bucks and stuff like that by selling my cell phone photography. So my uh, hero shot is always a floor, so you should also take images from your private floor and sell it to the uh, Getty uh, marketplace and earn some money. And that's also some clients we're working for. And why is Gen here? It's because um, th our technology. This is a, I don't know if you know uh, Kessels Kramer, but this is an art installation by him, and he printed all the images uh, uploaded to Flickr or to Facebook or Instagram on this room. And you can imagine this is a mess, right? And that's the reason why we are building a technology. It's called I'm Vision, and um, it's, uh, it's teaching technology like a kid or like a person that you can detect, okay, this is a good image or this is a bad image. Because here you can also see this is a community member, this is a magnet photographer, and everybody knows this is a selfie, right? And there's, there's mass or there's, um, you, can, you can detect good photography, not only by sizes or the devices, because if you know that it's a Leica or somebody shot it with a Leica, then you know maybe probably it's a better image. But with our community, we can detect, okay, it got a lot of likes or the people are, have a lot of followers. That's the reason why it's a better image. But also we have this machine learning and data learning and I'm not the technician, so I can't say the proper words, but in, in a nutshell, it's scanning the images, comparing it with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the other images and say, okay, this might be a better image. And uh, yeah, that's the reason why we are building stuff like that. Uh, scanning images and keywording them that uh, agencies and publishers can find them in a nice way. And this is really outstanding because normally you use manual people in uh, India, or whatever, keywording it manually. And we have this technology helping photographers that people can find the images. And um, you should also try it out. This is also an image because we have a web upload you upload an image and then it's keywording um, childhood uh, person and food and drink and it's really magic so you should check it out. It's not uh, self-proportion for me but uh, you, you should check it out and see how accurate and how interesting this technology is and um, it's also for free. And we are building that to give our photographers um, the possibility to get exhibited like here or have a, um, um, because there's so many images, right? So we have to filter it and we can't curate it manually. And that's the reason why we use also this kind of technology 
to publish those people or give them a stage and um, feature them on our blog post or on our popular feed. Because if you open the popular feed on Instagram, it's a lot of food, it's selfie or celebrities, right? But we want to give real photographers a stage that uh, maybe they don't have a lot of uh, friends and followers, but they have beautiful images and we can scan it. And that's the reason why even a new photographer without any friends could be in the popular feed. And also those images like Wired or whatever can find it and also people can buy it and post it on Instagram. And yeah, hopefully you got the idea of I am technology. And yeah, that's I am. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, that was fast. <laughs> I have to rewind this later a little bit. Um, just to like, point your attention to this once more, the, the, one, the, the one bit that I'm personally most curious about, and I still haven't fully understood it, is that technology that essentially auto-tags the pictures with a kind of quality um, that is stunning, maybe frightening, uh, but certainly offers a very interesting potential in, in dealing also with large quantities of images. Um, so I kind of see this technology replacing me within what I do, which is cool. <laughs> Somehow I can do different things. Um, so the grand finale, as I told you beforehand, uh, Jacqueline comes from Getty, yeah. he's company mentioned before, company that helps making this happen. Um, but she's not here to just like uh, present Getty, but she's here to add to that conversation with another perspective onto the changes in the field of photography. Please welcome. Thank you, Sven. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I hope you've got a little bit of patience left. I know it's been a very long day. I'm going to keep it very short and sweet. Um, and I'm going to first just introduce myself a little bit because I have a very strange, unusual role at Getty Images. Um, I work on a, almost a very secretive team that's been around as long as the history of the company. So we're celebrating nearly 21 years um, next month at Getty Images. I've been asked today to speak about um, how you know, the visual landscape is beginning to change um, with advances in technology from 360 photography to virtual reality. But before I begin, I'm the senior manager of Creative Insights. Um, I get both Getty Images and I stock by Getty Images. And it's a really strange title because it could mean all manners of things. Um, but essentially, my team, let me just see, can I work this? Hi. Here we go. It's a little slow. Great. So essentially, my team, we're very much tasked with visual trends forecasting. And we're always asked, how do we go about this? You know, is it a science? Is it an art? Is there an art to the science? And so on. So the first thing I would say is we're all creatives on our team. And we've all worked as either art directors, photo editors. We've all been contributors. And we're also data nerds. So we're that kind of meeting point between creative and, and geeks. And we have at our fingertips every day that we walk into the office 20 years plus of customer buying trends in terms of visual communications from all around the world. So what that essentially means is we can go to our data warehouse and ask, you know, what are the most top selling images around a particular concept in a particular region in the world and how has that evolved over time? And the other thing that we have at our fingertips is we get to analyze all of the searches that are typed into that very small Getty Images search box, an iStock search box, to see what our customers are searching for. And once we trawl through all of that, there are so many fascinating stories that we could possibly tell around visuals. And customers always ask us, well, well how do you decide which visual stories to follow, which ones will have um, importance for 2016? And the ways in which that we really do that is the data insights that we see, we very much have to connect them by looking outwards. So we have to really begin to understand what are the key social, cultural, economic, and technological trends um, that are really shaping human behavior. What we're always asking ourselves when we come into the office every day is, well, what does it mean to be this people in this moment in time? Because essentially, that is what we're powerfully engaging with when we look at visuals. 
So, um, on the Giddy Images website every year, just to give you some sense of the scale, just click this one, and um, we have about one billion searches, customer searches on the website, and we do deep dive down into that data. And it tells us a great many things. So for the purposes of today, we have pulled out some uh, customer stats, which will show you why we are focusing on this very important area of um, the hybrid between man and machine, or man and robotics, or man and artificial intelligence. And we have seen just from some very, you know, expected results that wearable technology as a customer search has risen by over 11,765%. We are obsessed this year and last year with the Fitbits, the Jawbones, the smart technology. Um, but there's also things like emojis, as we've seen a good bit in uh, Gen's uh, presentation, a very quick read and quick way to uh, communicate. And then, you know, smart houses, smart watches, uh, drones, robots, hands, and so on. So we really have to sit down and look at, well, why is this important? Obviously, in the editorial space, you know, we're all having those conversations. We're having them across social media. We're concerned, we've got anxieties, or we're excited, on the other hand, about the power of artificial intelligence and what robotics means to us. So a couple of studies that really interest us that we've been reading about at Getty Images on the creative research team is um, there's this growing um, um, amount of studies in cognitive um, psychology at um, how we feel about uh, robots, how we feel about um, becoming partially robotic. And one interesting study that came out of Japan was where um, they brought together um, a lot of people and they showed them imagery of um, somebody cutting off a human hand versus somebody cutting off a robotic hand. And what they found was the levels of empathy of how we feel and empathize with the person who's in pain. So whether it's a human, you know, um, feeling empathy with a human or a human feeling empathy with a robot, there was no significant difference. So we seem to have anthropomorphized and given human qualities to robotics. And um, the visuals here just on the right hand side, this is just a very quick one. Again, as you can see, emojis are quite high in our customer searches. This is an installation by Toyota Prius um, that they did at a show in Sydney very recently. And they transformed the window screens of their cars with emoji happy faces and you know, said, hug me and, and so on. And they, and they found people were coming up and hugging the cars. Um, so, for an art point of view, um, we've also had a look at, well, what are the real benefits? So, from, from feeling great empathy um, with robotics, um, also what's really happening in the brain? Because, again, we're trying to understand um, well, how visuals work on, on, on our brains. So, another key study that came out that I think was quite interesting, and again in the fields of cognitive psychology, that came out of the University of California, was, um, and it's continuing on at the moment till about 2017, 2018, is around one particular subject story that we found especially interesting. And it was an old lady called Fran, who's 88 years of age, and she's suffering from Parkinson's disease. And it was very much about um, her experiences in Second Life, in virtual reality, and how it has absolutely transformed her life, and um, how she can go online and she can get involved in activities. But what they were interested in actually really mapping was what is going on in the brain. And what they found was that she felt um, in her real world, her real physical world, that actually she was getting better and her condition was getting better. And in the brain, they really began to discover from some other stories as well, that um, what our brain interprets virtual reality the same way as physical reality. So a key example of this, if we think about um, if we think about all the babies that are born in the world, we've got something like 371,000 babies born every day. But we also have 800,000 iPhones are purchased every day. And we have like 1,500 um, Androids that are being activated as well on the same day. But the key question then we ask ourselves is, is well, what's happening to the brain of the gen this generation that is being born? Um, how is that being interpreted in terms of their sense of space, their sense of optics, when and we have the situation where um, babies can learn how to swipe, that swipe gesture on a mobile phone before they can walk, before they can talk. Um, so again, a couple of studies that came out of um, the University of Stanford um, 
by a great um, long-standing virtual reality researcher, Jeremy Bailson. If you haven't read his work, it's really fascinating. And he um, brought together um, a group of um, second grade high, um, middle school students in the US, and he brought them into the, his virtual reality lab in Stanford, and um, they began to swim with fishes and go under the water and swim with whales and so on. And when they brought them back several weeks later and they interviewed them, what they found was, and this is highly significant, that one in every two children, or that's 50% of the children um, that went through this experience, had false memories of actually really visiting a sea aquarium. So again, it's how, how, again, the human brain is interpreting virtual reality, especially on younger brains, the same as real physical space. So at Getty Images, we've been doing a lot of work um, around 360 photography, and we've begun to do a lot of partnerships with Oculus and producing and really beginning to understand what are the considerations across the visual landscape um, that will really connect with people and what is becoming more and more important in terms of visual aesthetics. So we have on our iPhone, I'm sure those in the audience who have an iPhone 6S and so on, have played around with live photos. We're beginning to see, you know, it's almost like the next chapter of the animated GIF, you know, this point of um, a little bit more movement in a photograph. For me, what's especially interesting about the live photo is the fact that, um, and for those you who don't know a lot about it or haven't used it, which I'm sure is in a very few minority, is the fact that it will shoot a video, it will also shoot audio, and it will shoot a JPEG. And what it does is it shoots a couple of seconds before you press the button and decide to capture that moment, and a couple of seconds afterwards. It's quite tight. For me, what's really significant about that is that um, it's all about getting lost in the presence, getting lost in that presence when you decide to click, but it's already been pre-recorded. The same with 360. For us, we've been working in the area of 360 photography um, since about 2012 at Getty. And I'll be very frank and honest, um, it is only this year for us, with the advances in technology, that we're beginning to see how much more we can do in this area. In terms of the world of editorial, you know, for, for all of us who can't get to the Rio Olympics this, uh, this year coming, um, we will be shooting a lot of 360. And it's very much about the point that we can immerse ourselves now in an event. Traditionally, when we would do this 360 photography, beginning in the last couple of years, we would have to get a tripod, you'd have to have a lot of technical skill, you'd have to make sure you had a level balance, then you had to bring back the content, you'd have to stitch it, and it would take quite a bit of time. Um, back on the computer, and now um, we've been doing a partnership with Rico, who have um, a new spherical camera that is literally grab it, point it, and it does the whole event immediately, which I think is really going to revolutionize and democratize that kind of technology. And what it really is beginning to change is point of view. And um, mobile photography has really brought on the rise and the importance of first-person storytelling. We're all taking selfies. We're all um, from moment to moment sharing our moment in life. So we are all photographers. We are all content creators. But 360 degree, what it does is it almost smashes that rectangular compositional frame that we have been using. And it allows the viewer to really begin to decide in any shared space what frame they want, which will have huge ramifications for editorial, you know, it'll have huge ramifications for crime and so on. Um, also, a huge study that we did last year, because more and more of the content that we are getting in, that people are taking um, out of those two trillion you know, images that are shot every year, is coming from mobile photography. So we commissioned a massive study last year, um, based on a lot of client requests that we had, on really beginning to understand what kind of mobile, um, what kind of photography um, works best on a small smartphone screen and the ways in which consumers and brands really want us to disappear inside that screen and break up that frame. So what we found out, it was super sensory imagery. And what that essentially means is imagery that appeals not only to the visual sense, but to as many senses as possible. So in terms of a visual language, you know, you are thinking about texture, tactileness, and um, you're thinking about dynamic color to pull the eye in. Um, and one of the key little visual trends around this that we've really seen, and it's a micro trend that's really beginning to gather speed and pick up, is one we're calling mesthetics, which essentially is messy aesthetics. 
So if we roll back in time on the Getty Images website, traditionally customers would type into our search box, I want you know, a, mess, uh, a messy room after a party, or I want a messy teenager's bedroom. But now what we found, and it's really increased radically in the last 12 months, is we're, there we're getting asked for messy desktops, messy offices, messy workspaces, messy cars, you know, messy streets, and so on. And it's really begun to, pick, um, to gather speed. And really, it's been driven by the, the longing for the tactile, the longing, the more we spend uh, looking at our screens, to actually feel a much more deeper and immersive experience. And again, a lot more around liquidity and fluidity and so on, if you talk about kind of smooth aesthetics. So another trend that has really begun to rise, and I think this has really been driven by virtual reality, is a trend we've called surreality. Um, so obviously it comes from the surrealist movement. But again, in terms of just sports and lifestyle imagery and so on, and the fact, and, and Gen has talked a little bit about this, that a lot of, there's been a huge demand in advertising in the last six to eight years for authentic photography, real photography. You know, let's show real people sharing real emotions and real locations all around the world that we can use in advertising and brand messaging messaging. But in that sense, in the last 12 months, we've really seen a shift in what customers are looking for, and they're beginning to really want something different, something that speaks to that um, sense that we have of virtual reality, and it is surreality. So again, just a quick insight into some of our customer searches that have grown in the last 12 months. Obviously, no surprise with all the topical uh, conversations and developments around virtual reality. It's grown by 360%. But the one for me that was the most interesting was surreal landscape. Customers were looking for, and they're simply coming to the website for visuals, and um, whether it's video or imagery around a surreal landscape. Bizarre, we always have typed in. Surreal, we always have. Weird, dreamy. But surreal landscape was something we really had to look at to see what they were buying, what they were engaging with. So whether it was something that's familiar but slightly strange, so where the images are flipped and are at unusual angles, to these wonderful meat landscapes, something that's very out there and very different that you know that when you're in this experience, it is completely different and fantastical. Um, to, you know, just um, beautiful interpretations of physical body landscapes. Um, and the most important one, I think, is we are in this hyper world of copy and cut and paste, the way we can add so many filters on our smartphone and we can play around with it and make memes and so on. We're seeing a lot of um, refraction and kaleidoscopic type of visual language on the rise, as well as this kind of over, you know, multiplicity um, that's repeated over and over and over, like almost the updated version of Andy Warhol and the pop art movement and so on. So finally, that's it from me. Um, if you want to find out a little bit more, because I've very quickly spoken through a couple of trends, um, my team looks after um, the Visual Insights tab on um, a little part of the Getty Images website called stories.gettyimages.com. So please um, feel free to have a look at it. Uh, the German version of the site um, for you guys is also stories.gettyimages.com forward slash DE. And that's it from me. Great. Super. Thank you very much. Um, I have too many questions for the remaining 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but I probably think I'm uh, more interested even in your questions. Shall we start this way? Is there anyone having a question or comment for us to consider? No. OK, take your time. Well, just start the conversation here. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of going back and forth um, between these like almost opposite poles, you know, a, a kind of almost traditional uh, type of reportage photography exploring that um, part of the world or the history of architecture on one end and this super sophisticated analytical way of looking at photography. Um, which is done for the purpose, pretty much for the same purpose, right? Great storytelling, uh, very, very uh, strong visuals. And I'm, I'm kind of, um, I, I'm asking you the question I'm asking myself. Are you afraid of the, like, the, the digital side of photography development right now? No, I'm not afraid. Um, I'm not afraid. Um, I'm just, um, I don't know how to, I mean, I, I don't, I'm afraid for me, actually, <laughs> because, because I don't even have Instagram. Yeah. So, um, no, I think it's really exciting that people can, I mean, I don't know, like, 
people who are don't ha haven't gone to school for photography or like have can do that. Um, and I think I think it's exciting, you know. The only thing is that I think I should start working on mm. the technological side you. of things. I too. hear you. Okay, <laughs> um, Jacqueline, there's one thing you, you touched upon, like um, 360 yeah. and VR. There is an, a, an incredible amount of innovation happening in in image taking devices right now. Yeah. Is that something that you're also observing and does that have an effect on the actual visual languages? Yeah, it does. Um, we really have to look at yeah how people are using it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I always think it's, while technolo technological advances are exciting because it allows us to do more quicker, it's more how we're using it. Mm. So I think like there's a very interesting guy called um, Chris um, Milk. I don't know if you know about him, but he's doing an awful lot around VR video and visual immersive storytelling that I think is really moving that story forward. So again, that's what we really want to see and what we're trying to figure out is how surprising is it? If is, is it moving in a different direction? Is it taking something that we all love and adore or something that we've forgotten about and actually switching it up and, and beginning mm. to tell and use it? And, re and, and for us, really, it's about how is it affecting the human brain? and how yeah. we process it. Yeah, that was super exciting to, to see the uh, yeah, analytic, academic research part of that as well. But um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but I, I kind of, uh, out of interest, I followed technology developments in photography and there are all sorts of like weird cameras. You know, the camera that takes pretty much, a, a, what is it, like a picture every couple of seconds, yeah. right? And you just like clip it on and it, it kind of, yeah, documents your life. You'll never be able to see it, but Nevertheless, you have those pictures, or the, the, the camera, the, I think it's called light field camera, mm -hmm. that captures an image, mm -hmm. and later on you'll decide Where the what, the, what the focus, focus is. is. So yeah. you, you do a, like the, yeah, it's like reverse photography almost. Um, and I'm, I'm super, I don't know, I'm, I'm like curious to see how this is going to translate somehow, right, into, into just different images. Yeah. You know, it's like seeing different the world in a way languages. that we've yeah. never seen them before. Cool. Um, again. So this algorithm, this like taking over my job type of algorithm, uh, how smart is it? I mean, I, I understand that it tags the pictures in a, in a like more advanced way, um, and it also kind of makes a or it could potentially make a decision what's a good image and what's a bad image. Um, where is this going? I mean, what what is the like the business opportunity you see in that? Yeah, business is straightforward, but. Um it's um, helping at the end. That's what I want to show is the Eric Kessel image mm -hmm. that we are floated by a lot of images and you can't find the right images, right? And that's the reason why we try to keyword it, the, the, the uploaded images over our platforms and because you can't keyword everything manually and that's the reason why we mm -hmm. want to at the end replace the keywords but not replace the, you or the, the curators mm -hmm. or stuff like that. Okay. There's another like killer feature I felt on your side, which is um, at some point you kind of uh, allowed the users to not just upload the picture, but almost upload the creative process that led to the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could actually see, you know, how was this image kind of modified to exactly, to yeah. to be what it is, so that you could, in, the way I understand it, you can actually take the same picture, modify it in four different ways, and then learn about your own picture, what works better or how this engine would think this works better. You know, so you have like the same portrait and you turn it like black and white color and like, I don't know, super overexposed. Yeah. And then you'll see how the, what the algorithm at least is gonna make out of it. And I feel that's an interesting, uh, uh, just a way of like learning more about mm -hmm. your own images, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, you're also cultivating this discussion in these community events that you yeah, showed us, right? Yeah, it's super important to educate photographers and because we are not reaching out to professionals. It's more making users who download the app, they're normal people like, like me or whatever, and uh, they, they, they get better, they get educated, they, they read the blog or they see this, it's called open edit, and uh, you can see, okay, he used this filter and a uh, visco cam and whatever, and this adjustments, and then you can learn from it. It's not, and you can decide if you want to show this mm. edits and stuff like that. So it's also up to you, the photographers. It's not that we are, copying or, 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 or stealing this information. Yeah. So it's, it's about you. I yeah. think it's, it's super fair and transparent. That's super important. And mm. also compared to Instagram and Facebook, we are the, 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 you are always the creative owner. So y we are not giving away the, the, the or stealing it. So mm. that's what you do at Facebook and stuff like that. When 
upload an image that people can use it at Nike without paying or asking you. Yeah, that's also something I, I mean, I feel, you know, it's great to have uh, this, this like thinking of a business model because after all that's, that's the big challenge, right, for the photographers to sign, find the funding or the, the assignments to do the great stories and, and I, I, I somehow feel the more channels we offer or the more kind of uh, touch points we create, even for the non-professional photographers, if they have great images, it will be it will be beneficial for like photography and the the users and the like observers. After all, um, did I is that correct? I just read this article the other day that somebody that was kind of like an amateur user of uh, like photographer on IM was picked for like the Apple campaign yeah, yeah, imagery that, like yeah. twice. Yeah, yeah, that happens. Sometimes, okay, yeah. so. If you're a professional, <laughs> non-professional, you want to be like on this big billboard, <laughs> you want to go there. Go there. <laughs> um, this is another thing that I, I kind of realized. So that probably my last question. Um, all of you also have like this kind of publication uh, passion, I'd say. You know, I mean, you showed a, like the, the finished magazine of the, the Arctic sailing trip. You have one, you've one, you also have one that I saw up front. Yeah. So um, could you describe, maybe just in a short round of statements, uh, starting with you, Adam, um, how the, what the magazine, I mean, how that kind of is an important medium to kind of tell your stories, the visual photography stories? I think uh, in our in our Okolo magazines, or we, we feel it like it's really compact, um, um, compact visual and uh, information um, uh, thing. Like mm. uh, it's, uh, I, I like on the magazines that it's like uh, start and finish, and it's really nice to have something which is one topic or one genre, one atmosphere, and you you have it like in your in your library that. For example, on the internet, or there's a lot of articles, very nice ones, but still it's kind of uh, somewhere in the air. Yeah. And I like, the, I like this on the, on the magazine medium, that you create kind of statement in a in nice format. <laughs> I also very much uh, like the, the, the small exhibitions you put up. You, know, you showed up one, uh -huh. uh, but where, you, where the images were just transformed into a, almost like a sculptural scape so not just yeah. putting them up on the wall it was super i am magazine yeah, like what three issues four issues now exactly the third one and it's it's the same so the attention on mobile is so short that okay even f facebook instagram you you get just a couple of seconds of attention right and it's it's super sad that a lot of people put a lot of effort into images photography design and that's the reason why it's important to have it physical, and that's the reason why publishing and print is never dead. And for sure, the quality should be better and whatever, the curation, but at the end, it's nice to have it. And at the end, it was also selfish for me. That's uh, why I created the magazine, because I wanted to have it for myself at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess for me, I'm quite obsessed with um, the object itself, you know, like I think, um, I don't know, I think maybe there are like, um, a lot of times I think there are like too many images, too many information, too many of everything right now. And I think to have, it's really easy to get lost in the internet. And if you don't have the, some, like, if you don't have your images or any images, like physically, for me it's really easy that they just get Mm. sort of lost, and also I'm really disorganized, so it's really nice for me to have like <laughs> an object that I can keep. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would echo the same thing. I, I just think it's quite funny because just before I left to come here today, Ute, my colleague, is here in the audience somewhere, um, but we were literally pouring over um, tears and, and laying out a design, and I was struck, and she can testify, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the kind of quality of the print against mm. my cheek and so on, and I think that's that drive for the tactileness. And I have to honestly say, at Getty Images, um, while a lot of advertising and brand needs have really gone into the digital space, um, our business for prints, for wall art and so on is just, it's thriving. And I think what happens is the more we lose ourselves in the screen and it, it, we, we then almost rarify as well the, 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 the um, tactileness of the, of the print quality. 
So it's always that way that society goes. The more you divide, you get to equal polemics. Agree, yeah. agree. Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess we can like finally call this kind of digital versus analog conversation over and yeah. solved. <laughs> because um, we've heard that a million times over the last days as well, that it's just a matter of integrating it properly. Because, I mean, n no one of us is either just digital or just uh, analog. And, and it's just a matter of using it in a smart way. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it was exciting, a pleasure to hear you. Any more questions? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I kind of knew it. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, okay. <laughs>